Okay, in a previous video, I ran a confirmatory factor analysis based on data from this article found at the Plus One website. The article is Discussed Assessment, Factorial Structure, and Psychometric Properties of the French Version of the Discussed Propension and Sensibility Scale, Revised 12. So uh, the article is open source. You can either download a PDF or just read it online. And if you click on Supporting Information, you can go down you can see the data uh, that's actually in an Excel file. So I've uh, actually uh, imported the data. Uh, I actually first imported it into X to uh, SPSS and then moved it into Excel, but you can directly import it into Excel if you want. The basic model that they started out with looked like this, and their final model basically looked like this. So um, their initial model, they had a set of items that were loaded onto propensity, uh, and then another set of items loaded onto sensitivity. You'll notice that uh, uh, one uh, factor loading from uh, each latent variable to an indicator is fixed at one so that we can scale the latent variables in relation to that uh, manifest variable. And uh, in the re uh, final revised version, there's actually uh, two less items that are loaded onto the sensitivity factor. So when the authors, um, when the authors were uh, going through and setting up their analysis, they discovered that there was evidence of a violation of the multivariate normality assumption, which is uh, required when you're using maximum likelihood estimation um, in the context of SEM. And so what they uh, did, they were using the R program, and what they did was they utilized uh, robust estimation methods. So you can see right here they talk about maximum likelihood with robust uh, Huber-White standard errors and then a scaled uh, test statistic. Um, in Amos, uh, they don't have that capability or we don't have the capability to uh, carry out robust tests. Um, however, there are other options to, uh, that are available in the, if you have a situation where there's evidence of a violation of normality. So the objective in this video is to show you um, a couple of options utilizing bootstrapping. So what I'm going to do is go under here, or go into uh, my uh, Amos program with our initial model, and so this is it right here. And what you'll see is that I've already imported the data into um, Amos. And so what I want to do is just kind of walk you through the steps. Uh, and the first step that I'm going to show you just really briefly is evaluating uh, the normality assumption uh, in the first place. We already know that there's evidence of multivariate non-normality, but we're going to just going to take a quick step, uh, side step, to look at uh, normality of the variables in this uh, data. So I'm going to go under Analysis Properties, and I've already kind of been playing with this, but you can see that uh, first off, you, you'll notice that I have not clicked estimate means and intercepts. And you generally are going to do that when you have uh, missing data. Uh, there's no missing data in this data set, so I'm going to leave that alone. Um, but just kind of keep in mind that if you have missing data in your data set, uh, you're not going to be able to test for non-normality and you're not going to be able to utilize non-parametric bootstrap. So it's a little irritating, but um, that's just kind of the way it is. So if you have missing data in your data set, you're going to need to come up with some strategy for addressing that problem so that you end up with a complete data set uh, that you can run um, uh, utilizing these other options. So at any rate, uh, so I'm leaving that blank and I'll go under output. You'll see that I've already clicked on standardized estimates, squared multiple correlations, and test for uh, normality and outliers. Um, and you'll notice that under bootstrap, and I'm, I'm going to actually deselect this for the time being because I'm just going to focus on uh, the assessment of normality. Um, but so what we're going to do is we're just going to start there. So what I'll next do is uh, go to calculate estimates, click on it and I'm going to open up the uh, text file and you can see that we have our first of all you'll notice that there here we have the model fit statistics and uh, again these are all assuming normality or multivariate normality so uh, one downside of a violation of multivariate normality is that it can actually increase the likelihood that you reject your model when you maybe you shouldn't. Um, so that can it can basically lead to an inflated chi-square value and, and basically a lot of our fit statistics are, are built around that. So you have a greater likelihood of, uh, of concluding that, that you have lack of fit. So that's one potential problem. And then another possible problem are, is that you end up driving down the standard errors within your model and so the test of your parameter estimates you can actually 
uh, have an increased likelihood of committing a type 1 error. So those are basically two problems that you, that um, that we have to consider when we have a violation of non-normality and that's one of the reasons why we have to adopt alternative strategies for analyzing the data. So if we go under uh, assessment of normality you'll see that we have uh, in this chart right here we have basically a skewness and kurtosis statistics and these are the ind indicator variables within the model so you'll notice that we have basically measurements that help us to assess univariate normality and then we also have uh, multivariate kurtosis value right here uh, to basically assess uh, or, or is you help to utilize to assess multivariate non-normality. So just keep in mind too that just because you have univariate nor non -normal uh, univariate normality doesn't mean that you necessarily have multivariate normality. So it's a good practice to kind of evaluate both. So the skewness statistics right here uh, we, uh, you know, if you want to just use this from a descriptive standpoint, what we're looking for in general are values that are going to fall between a negative two and a positive two, and uh, you know, so values that are falling outside that range would be an indicator of uh, perhaps uh, you know a more substantial skew uh, on your variables. The kurtosis uh, values right here. Um, basically what we're looking for are values that are above seven or at least uh, Barbara Byrne uh, references uh, Klein from his text uh, using sort of a, a rough guide of uh, or a value of seven as indicator of uh, potential more substantial problems with um, uh, kurtosis uh, for your variables. So you can see that descriptively all of these uh, don't meet that as well. So you know just from a descriptive standpoint looking at skew and kurtosis there's no real substantial evidence of, um, of a univariate normality. Now when it comes to judging the multivariate normality um, Barbara Byrne uh, in her book she cites uh, Bentler's work uh, from 2005 suggesting that a normalized estimate that is greater than five would be indicative of a violation of the uh, multivariate um, uh, uh, assumption. Or so basically, you would have more substantial um, multivariate kurtosis. So this is the normalized value. It's just basically the critical ratio right here, and you can see that this value is greater than five, and so that would be an indicator that we have a violation of multivariate normality. Just so you know, too, that um, you know, if it were the case that we we had evidence within the uh, individual um, indicators of uh, non-normality, we might want to check for um, outliers. And so, you know, one way to do that is just to go into SPSS or whatever program and you know convert the the uh, uh, observations on the individual variables to z-scores. Um, when we're talking about the issue of multivariate um, uh, non-normality, then we might be interested in, in checking to see if uh, the individual observations uh, differ substantially from the centroid of the variables. So this is where Mihalanobis distance comes into play and basically uh, this is just the, the computed distance between an observation in multivariate space and the uh, centroid for the variables. It's basically just the multivariate mean for all the variables. And so you'll see that we have a columns here that are, are utilized to judge statistical significance. Uh, the P1 column right here, this is um, one way to do it. And you can see that we have a number of, um, of cases that uh, where the P values are quite low. Uh, all the way down to here and so you might be thinking well let's just use that as our threshold uh, like a 0.05 level or whatever in order to uh, determine that a case is an outlier but you know these all can't be outliers so another way of looking at it is that we could also look at the Mahalanobis distance values and look for more substantial jumps like between this uh, value right here or this case and this case right here or you know some uh, sort of a break point if you will uh, that might be an indicator of uh, of um, that you might have an outlier present in your data. So at any rate, that's just kind of a FYI there for you. Now, we've, like I said, we've already demonstrated that we have a violation of multivariate normality. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to go under bootstrap. And so we have, uh, we have a couple of options. Um, first off, if we want to evaluate the overall model fit, um, again, our our previous statistics that we kind of sh I showed you here, these are all assuming multivariate normality. So 
um, from that standpoint, that, that can be a problem. So what we can do, though, is we can utilize the Bolin-Stein bootstrap in order to uh, come up with um, a way of evaluating the overall fit of the model. So we're going to use uh, bootstrapped uh, ML right here, and I'm going to click on Perform Bootstrap, and I've set it at 2,000. So what we'll do now is we will uh, click on our Calculate Estimates, and the bootstrapping has been uh, carried out. So I'm going to open up the view text and you'll see now we have uh, we can actually look at the bootstrap distribution. So basically bootstrapping is just a um, a resampling technique and what we're going to be basically be doing is we're comparing the chi-square from our data against bootstrap samples and there was 2,000 bootstrap samples we computed the chi-square uh, values from each of those and it forms a sampling distribution um, of, for of those chi-square values and you'll see that our data is actually falling uh, pretty much right around here so um, in other words most of the bootstrap chi-square um, uh, values are falling you know well below our um, where we fall with our actual data now is this significant well the ba what we do is we can go under uh, the Bolenstein bootstrap and you can see right here uh, it says the model fit better in uh, you know almost the entire set of samples uh, you know 1997 1997 bootstrap samples uh, it fit worse in three so there's a p-value that's assigned to our data which is 0 .002 the null hypothesis is that the model that our model is correct so if we reject the null hypothesis then we're essentially concluding that our model is a poor fit to the data so at this point that that's a bit of a problem so what we'll do now is but I will say that uh, you know the original fit statistics for the model uh, weren't terribly great they were they were okay but they weren't great so what the authors ended up doing was they actually ended up uh, in their final model they took out two uh, items and so I'm just going to kind of pivot to that um, to this particular uh, model right here without those two items and I'm going to rerun the analysis with the same bootstrap uh, procedure so I'm going to go under again analysis properties uh, bootstrap you can see it's still uh, selected right here so we're good and I'm going to calculate the estimates and so now when we open it up you can see that actually the model fit was uh, way better so you can actually see the CFI uh, TLI you know but again these are all assuming uh, normality but you can see these are really really quite good and um, you know given that uh, the tendency is to uh, inflate the likelihood of rejection of your model um, when you have multivariate non-normality, then uh, these are actually, you know, all suggesting a pretty good uh, model fit to the data. But nevertheless, just to further illustrate uh, the Bolenstein, I'm going to go back to bootstrap uh, distributions, and our, our, our data is um, our chi-square from our data is 48.788. So, um, you know, kind of looking at it uh, in here, you can see that it would be falling, you know, right around uh, here, you know, within the sampling distribution. Um, of the chi-square values. If I click on the Bolenstein bootstrap, you can see that now it says the um, you know model fit better in 1,816 samples, but if it fit, fit equally well in zero samples and fit, uh, fit, fit worse um, in 184 samples, but the p-value is 0 0.092, uh, so that would be an indication that we would not be rejecting um, our model in terms of the fit. So now we, that we have you know established you know quote unquote good model fit um, then what we want to do is we also want to test the individual parameters within the model so basically what we'll do is we'll go back under analysis properties now you might be asking why didn't we just bootstrap uh, when we ran the Bolenstein and the fact of the matter is is that um, if you know in this particular case I actually had inadvertently left this uh, clicked and when I ran the bootstrap with the Bolenstein you'll see that uh, there are no um, there are no uh, bootstrap um, tests for the individual parameters, so you can you can have this clicked up here to to uh, to perform you know uh, and and this is necessary to perform bootstrap tests of the individual parameters. But if you have Bolin Stein uh, clicked, it's not going to work. So I'm going to click off of this, and uh, I've also set my bootstrap confidence intervals to 95. The default in Amos is is 90, but I'm going with 95. And so now when I click on Calculate Estimates, 
I'll uh, open up my file and you can see that now uh, uh, when I click on um, estimates uh, and scalars you'll see that now we have regression weights and down here at the bottom it says uh, estimates and bootstrap so uh, you'll see right here these are all the regression weights and there's a their normal theory um, you know standard errors and critical ratios um, but what we want to do is to go down to bootstrap confidence and you'll see right here that we have uh, again, our estimates. Notice that you know again these two paths are are are, are factor loadings are fixed at one. So the estimates are really coming from all of these right here. So really, it's not there's no point in trying to evaluate um, this um, uh, the um, items one and two from the scale. But you'll see that we have our estimates, our factor loadings, and then you'll see that we have lower and upper. So basically, what we're doing in this case, um, if we want to test for statistical significance using the confidence interval, then we would say that if zero, which would be the null hypothesis, if it falls uh, outside of that confidence interval from between outside of the lower and upper bound, then we would reject the null and infer that there's that the um, that our parameter is statistically significant. If zero falls between the lower and the upper bound, then we would determine that our parameter is not is not significantly different from zero. Um, another option is just we have a p-value right here so you could use that just as easily and so you can see that for each of these uh, these uh, items all of them would be deemed as statistically significant.